Hi, this is Steve Gunn and welcome to a series we call The Flow. This is episode two. This is called Getting on the Path. Our series is around a core concept about working with the natural ways of the universe in all its forms. And so we'll cover everything from astrology through meditation to how your own energy and natural foods can heal the body, from what seemingly supernatural through ghosts and other experiences to our empathic communication with others and animals and everything in between. Anything that relates to flowing and being aligned with the natural order of things. The basis of that premise is that our universe is primarily an energetic entity. It's fueled by universal force or energy that runs through all things and connects all living things, the universal life force, otherwise known as chi. As children, we naturally sense this energy and naturally very in tune with it. But as we grow and develop, we are taught to see the world primarily as a physical entity. We learn that what we can touch and see are real. And so we learn physics, geometry, physiology, mechanics, mathematics, geography, astronomy, mineralogy, meteorology, electrics, electronics, construction, you name it. And so as we develop this intellect, as we develop more of a grounding in physical reality, we tend to deaden our senses to the natural order of the world, these driving forces behind the cycles and the cycles within cycles, which control everything and which we sense and intuit as opposed to touch or see. Even on the most basic level, schools and colleges don't teach us how to deal with one of the most fundamental and yet the most powerful manifestations of this chi energy in our everyday lives and that is emotions and so society is not geared to the universe being energetic is really very geared to it being physical and so it becomes just another way we disconnect another way we get away from the flow we even go on to consider that if there is a force there that controls the world it controls it in terms of physical events because we see the world as a physical entity whereas it doesn't do that. What it does, it affects all living things. And it's the actions of these living things and interactions of these living things reacting to these energies that create physical events. But even though we've come very far away from this flow, even though society has trained us in this way, there's usually an inner voice that, although it was deadened, is not completely gone. Somewhere in the background it talks about that there's more to the universe than you can see. And, and most of us can identify with this. Couple that with seeing how all things are connected by noticing synchronicity and coincidence and seeing how cycles repeat in our own lives, we begin to start listening to that little voice again. This is the point where we start the spiritual journey. And along that journey will be many pointers, some large and some small. Many people hit a point we refer to as awakening, and that's where some events, some sizable shock takes us out of our intellectual consciousness, shocks us out of it and wakes us up to the world of energy in a very big and powerful way. So this week I'd like to, you to get to know some of our little team, some of our little flow posse here a little better as we discuss how each of us discovered and came closer to our awareness of this energy universe again and its ways, how we came out of the usual it's all mental physical mindset and gradually over a lifetime found and aligned closer to our spiritual path and the natural order of things, how we found the flow. Okay, let's uh, let's pick up with our posse. Uh, we'll start with Gail Jennett in the UK. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Steve. And how are things in the sunny UK? Uh, not too bad today. It's very overcast, but it's a beautiful autumn day. Quite warm down here, actually. Excellent. Unseasonally warm. Yeah, you're down on the south coast, aren't you, Bournemouth? Yes, right on the south coast. Beautiful part of the world. A little further north, up in Manchester, Sarah Davis. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. And how's Manchester today? Manchester is not as sunny as last week, but like Gail said, it's still very mild and pleasant. So is October still the new August? That's what I need to know. Definitely, cause, because our August was pretty dire, so <laughs> October is certainly a nice surprise. Excellent. Yep, I'm, st I'm sticking with that one. Excellent. And here stateside, Mike McGlatchy on the West Coast. How are you, Mike? I'm doing very well, thank you. And how are things where you are? Is it nice and sunny and warm today? You know, it's very sunny and warm during the day and very cool at night. Yeah, it's, it's starting to get that time of year, isn't it? 
Yeah. It's California and it's starting to rain just a little bit. So you've actually got some water now. Eh, sort of. It, it soaks into the ground almost immediately. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks all for joining us. Mike, can we start with you? I've introed the show and we've talked about how we went away from our awareness that we had as kids of this energy universe, this magic all around us and how we got conditioned into intellect and the physical world, but how we came out of it again. So that how our intuition developed events, people, circumstances, places. How was that for you? What influences were on your life? Well, um, you know, I actually lived in England from uh, like 1975 to 1980. And as a, as a young kid, um, I went to a public school. And um, even early on, when I was six or seven, I was interested in ghosts. And it was an old building, you know, an old school. And, and there were a lot of rumors going around at the school from a lot of the kids who had been there for a long time. And, and so I got interested in that very early and, and you know, um, always felt that there was something else from the very beginning. Um, later, when I moved to the United States, I would say that one of the things I noticed is, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a Christian household, and yet I know I was really into books, even as a kid, and I would go to the bookstore, and, and it was the weird section that I was always attracted to, yet I always feared it at the same time. Yeah. Well, did, did people around you recognize your interest, or did you keep it to yourself? Um, I, I think I, at least early on, I kept it to myself. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, you know, growing up in, in that kind of household, there is sort of a, um, apprehension that, you know, that there is the other and, the, and there's God. And so that there's, there's, there is something else. And so, you know, as a young kid, I, you know, I wanted to please my parents. And so a lot of it was just trying to follow through on the things I was learning. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, probably about 12 years old, I won an English prize at school and I got awarded a book of my choice and I chose a book on witchcraft and black magic. And the teacher looked at me as if I was the devil. And I was, <laughs> I was just interested in it as a subject, you know, sort of. Yeah, same here. Exactly. I'd go to this <laughs> book and, I, and I'd actually creep around the bookstore. You know, I, I, I can even remember when I was 10 or 11, sort of like, you know, like hiding behind a shelf and then going around and pulling one out and then running away really quickly. <laughs> What about you, Gail and Sarah? Did you uh, have an interest like that when you were younger? I certainly did um, in terms of I grew up with that, with my family being involved in, in sort of mediumship and, and the psychic thing. So for me, it wasn't that unusual. I, I can always remember as a young child, and I mean young, perhaps maybe six or seven, just having an awareness that of things being bigger than myself and having a particular fascination with uh, space, planets and UFOs. And I can remember way back in the sort of 70s, there used to be a, a I think it was a monthly circulation called The Unexplained. And I used to save my pocket money to, to get this magazine when everyone else was buying sort of Beano and Dandy. I was buying magazines on UFOs. Cool. <laughs> so I've always had that that kind of fascination with space and always had a feeling of there being something greater than myself. And, How did uh, that tie into the spiritualist interest of your family? Well, my great, great grandmother in uh, Belfast in uh, Northern Ireland, her name was Mary Kathleen and she was known back in the 1920s as having what they then called the second sight or the gift. And uh, although she wasn't uh, back in that day, people were extremely poor in that particular part of, you know, the country, people weren't charging for readings, but she was kind of known as the, the go-to person. If somebody wanted what they then saw as counseling, she would just say to people, uh, you know, I, I feel you need to go and see the doctor about your stomach. You know, she would predict things for people. And probably one of the greatest stories that um, was passed down to me was when back in the, during the Second World War, her son, John, was based in England. He was in an army base. And uh, one particular night, he was on duty. And apparently my great-great-grandmother told her family that night that John is dead. And they were like, don't be silly, he's in England. She said, no, I've just met him on the staircase and he was smiling at me. But back in those days, obviously, there was no communication other than telegrams. And so within a matter of days, sure enough, a telegram came through to say that his base had been bombed and he was killed instantly. And it was at the time that she'd met him on the staircase. So 
she did this sort of through her 40s onwards. She was a very quiet lady and she was just someone that people would see as a very kind lady who just seemed to know what was going on and she would often talk to the dead as they called it then. And then my mum also was very similar as a young child. She would have a feeling of something other than herself and then sort of dabbled in it until she was probably in her late 40s when she stopped doing it because she used to do it she used to read tea leaves and how did this and, all uh, affect you and influence you it just well it, it affected me in that i always had the interest in it and it was normal hmm. so it didn't feel like anything out of the ordinary to 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 know about these things to to know about spirits or hmm. to have ghosts we that had is ghosts the spirit, in our house. that is the spiritualist approach though isn't it where there's a world called spirit which is inhabited by a finite number of entities that are the souls of the departed as opposed oh, to the more metaphysical approach which is that they just become one unified entity as it were energetic entity oh yes it was very much from the, the spiritualist angle and no other yeah sarah what, what about you what were your influences um i was just always interested <clears throat> interested in ghosts interested in something more I don't know I didn't understand why or there was nothing really that influenced me but I I always was fascinated and intrigued and interested my mum would see mediums and have her tarot's done so it, that was quite normal for me and when we all got together families we'd all sit around and my grandma and her and my great nan and everybody would always say whoever goes first make sure you come back and let us know you're okay and I think things from that just made me think that that was normal it was never unusual to me to think of it in that way and I always sent things even from being a really young child I'd have dreams and I'd tell my mum at breakfast I've had this dream and this happened and then they would happen that happened quite a few times and I think from there it just I guess continued. So I talked about in my intro about how we get dragged away from that as we grow older were you dragged away from that or did you manage to maintain that all the way through? Um, I think the interest was always there but at different stages it would be more in focus than others. But I remember even being a child and feeling when people said things and just sensing something different. I didn't understand it, obviously. But I remember, I don't know, it, I can't explain it really. I just mm. knew it. It was, was a sense as more, opposed to yeah, it was information. A sense rather yeah. than understanding it or knowing what it was. That's just how it's always been. There was nothing that started that off. I was always fascinated as well for, again, as long as I can remember being a child even, in soulmates. I was absolutely fascinated and would read anything I could about them. And I don't know, again, there's nothing that triggered that off as a child that I remember. It was just in me is the only way I can explain mm. it. In my late teens, my mum got very involved in uh, spiritualism and she used to partner up with this lady who did readings and my mum would write the readings down and, and take notes and, and give them to the client and she was very interested in it. And that actually put me off immensely because um, so many of these people seem so emotionally codependent on this and the stuff she would come out with would be interesting but it was it was there was definitely a lot of mind reading going on which you do see in a lot of spiritualist reading they they tend to i'm not the greatest fan of spiritualism and i'll be absolutely upfront about that I mean, they do tend to do a lot of mind reading and tell people stuff they know with a lot of validation of how could they know that but these people were very emotionally codependent on the outcome of these readings and i saw the downside of it i saw the uh how it would actually would uh, make them want to come back again and again and again and be not necessarily deal with their own stuff and become independent so that and that really put me off although i had the sense of something greater i was pretty sure this wasn't it or it didn't feel like it for me if that makes sense did you all have a sense of when you walked into a room or met a person have you always have you all had that from the beginning yeah as long as i can remember what about you Gail? yes i would i would agree with that what about you mike yes all through my life can we move on and ask about what are the really big events in your life that really introduced you to this to get involved at a deeper level? Sarah, do you want to talk about that? Um, just 
thinking. There were so many things. I think it was coming to a stage where it was peaking. My interest was massively increasing and I was experiencing um, very extreme physical reactions to energy. And what sort of extreme physical me. reactions? Really, literally, as much as I've always sensed things around people, I would, they would come to talk to me and I'd be, ask them if they were okay or, and they'd say yes and I knew they wouldn't It was, and I couldn't let it go and I'd ask them, I'd say, but you're not and I don't know, it all, it became very overwhelming as well because I didn't have the ability to not have that. I couldn't turn it off if you So you, you were actually experiencing it as well as not just feeling the emotion, you were experiencing it as if it was you going through it, Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, your, I could actually mm. feel what they were feeling. That's your empathic abilities really starting to open up. That's very common with people when their empathic abilities open up. They open up super wide. And instead of just sensing what people go through, you actually go through it. And I know a lot of people try to close it down. That's not the way to deal with it. The way to deal with it is to learn to manage it as opposed to try and close it down. Because closing it down, you close your own energies down at the same time and then um, end up having problems. Yes, I know that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you've worked a lot on that since, haven't you? How is it now? Is it better now? Uh, it's definitely a lot better. It's something I have to work on all the time. But yes, tremendously better than it used to be. This stuff is always a work in progress, isn't it? How about you, Gail? How, what, what, what made your awareness grow as you've gone along? Oh, there's a whole series of events that made it grow. Um, I think I think I touched on it in the first show where um, I was just went searching after I got divorced and I just started delving down all different paths and I physically felt very differently and I, I guess to a certain extent a bit like Sarah, I, st I started taking on board other people's situations and really feeling it and got very much out of balance but as I discussed in the first show went off on different tangents and um, really became very unbalanced. Mike what about you what's brought it home to you more as you've gone through life? Well I'd say probably my first experience in terms of um I don't know, an orientation change maybe is that uh, I'm a musician, although I used to play more, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. And it, it was all consuming. And, and that's what I wanted to do at the time. I wanted to be in a band and I wanted to play and I wanted to write. But one of the things I noticed is that when I would get involved, I felt like often I was dragged away from it, either because of a, a strong emotional reaction or, or, you know, or just a general sense of unease that I was in the place that I was in. And this happened multiple times um, until I actually finally left the group I was playing in in the late 90s. And, and I just knew that even though it felt like I had the talent to do it and the will to do it, that that's not really where I was supposed to be. Yeah. Interesting point. Again, the empathic intuitive ability developing and overwhelming you to a sense, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's and, um, making your choices for you because you're finding it harder to stay where it doesn't feel like you should be, yeah? Right. And, and you know, the, the results of, of doing that really actually threw me into to researching and looking into spirituality. In fact, I even spent probably a good year and a half, you know, thinking I was an atheist for a while because, I, I you know, I wanted to push all that away. Mm. I wanted to feel like I wasn't, you know, dragged basically back into the, into the direction I was going in um, from, the, from the energy of it. I know a lot of people really suffer with this, That, and you see a lot of it on Facebook and that sort of thing, talking about energy vampires and pushing people away that have got very negative energy. And, and people can get very isolated and very much in a bubble, or they can tend to close their own energy down. And that's a very dangerous thing to do, because closing down your sensitivity or isolating yourself are both very unhealthy and that's one of the reasons it's really important to learn to manage your energy and your energy space something I know we all know about because it's something we all practice but um, I really want to emphasize the importance of that and to the, another thing that's really important is to understand that if people do pay you attention because of your energy if they're drawn to your energy you are not attracting them by turning your energy down you don't suddenly make them go away and by turning it up you you don't necessarily attract them that's something else that people really struggle with and i come across a lot of people in my work who are very suppressed 
because they've sort of turned the volume down on their energy because they're believing they're attracting things. And what I, what I explained is um, as, a, as a classic, as somebody said to me once that I go to these places and I do what I've got to do and I come back and somebody will call me two weeks later and say, I remember you, I know you remember me because I felt it. And the person was like, I haven't got a clue who this is I'm talking to. And what, the, what happened was they went to this place and they met some people and one of those people sensed this, this, um, this person's energy and their energy is very vibrant and strong. But in sensing it, that person wrongly interpreted that they had an intention towards them when everybody was picking up that same vibrant, strong energy from, from the person I was talking to as a client at the time. So wherever she went, people always felt vibrant and strong, but some people would then superimpose onto that that she had intended it for them. So these guys would call her and say, hey, it's me, I know you remember me, and she'd go, what the hell? <laughs> Is that something you guys have experienced? Uh, so I definitely have lots of. And what's it like? What's it, what actually happens and what's it like to go through? Um, I find it very difficult, actually. I find it challenging. It does make you think initially, is this down to me? Have I done something? But then when you are able to look mm -hmm. at it objectively, you realize that actually you treat most people the same. But it's it's the people, like you say, that pick up on that energy and they interpret that in their own way. I've had extremes of people being attracted to it immensely to very different degrees and also the absolute opposite as well of people taking an instant dislike, even accusing me of saying things that I haven't said, of being just very honest direct, and balanced and they'll literally throw back in my face something that I haven't said. So I ha I've experienced extreme reactions from people. What about uh, you, Mike or uh, Gail? Have you experienced that? Um, yeah, I think those um, polarized responses are very common. Um, they're still common, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even even encounters with strangers, you, you, you know, you can find people that are just really magnetized to you or that are really just repulsed by it. Polarized okay. is the key phrase, isn't it? They do tend to be extreme. Yeah. yeah. Very extreme. What about you, Gail? I noticed it having been sort of so out of balance for so long and perhaps very suppressed for probably many years that when I suddenly got myself healed and got really into the flow with the energies of the universe around me, it was just uh, really blatantly obvious. I mean, I was attracting all sorts of people in situations and it was really quite overwhelming to begin with and then that settled down thankfully but um i think i can't say i've experienced it personally but i do feel with other people that sometimes people's energies are so so strong that some people who don't understand perhaps how how energy works in the universe can be quite intimidated by people yeah absolutely the point the point is you're actually not attracting it the point is that there's a constant interaction these people are um, drawn to strong energy so um, whether it's flowing within you fully or not they, they tend to react to it so there's this illusion mm. that we're attracting it we don't actually we don't actually attract it by turning it up and and then uh, not attract it by turning it down it's most likely that people are reacting to it but you just didn't realize it because one of the problems yeah. I come across is people suppress because they do believe they're attracting it. But what they do when they suppress, they suppress their own consciousness of their energy. They don't suppress other people's consciousness of it. So if that makes sense, people are still yeah. very conscious of their energy. What they're doing is suppressing their own awareness of it and then compromising their own sanity and peace and health. But that's the way, particularly with things like the law of attraction now, this all attract and manifest thing that's going around. Um, it's, it's simple cause-effect logic, which the universe doesn't work like that. So the universe doesn't work in simple cause-effect logic. It works in interaction. It's interaction of things. So it's nobody's responsible or everybody's responsible, if that makes sense. So mm. what we want to do is always be flowing. But you will always get some you know, degrees of interaction. And uh, it's important to understand, I think, what's happening energetically. Otherwise... As, as you've all said, it's sort of crazy making, it doesn't make sense because you can be very 
uh, kind, fair to somebody and they can have an extreme reaction. They can want a piece of you or they can want to take you down or get very offended. As you said, Gail, they don't know how to deal with a very powerful energy. Now, the interesting mm. thing is how they react is how their own is a reflection of their own energy. So somebody who is insecure meeting somebody with a, with a strong flowing energy will either react in terms of taking it as a criticism because they feel the powerful energy and their ego is saying, oh, that person is more powerful me, than me. They'll immediately take it as criticism. The ego will go into defensive mode or they'll latch on to you wanting to be as strong as you, which is gives you a chance to as, as a, somebody who can help them find their own energy. That brings in the issue of um, they can appear like an energy vampire, but actually there's somebody who is presenting an opportunity to you to maybe help them and steer them in the right direction. Yeah. How are people around you? How are family and friends? Do you, do you generally guys generally talk about this or is this something you secretly live and, and just don't mention it? Do, do people think you're weird? People think I'm weird, but I'm cool with that. Uh, yeah, I can, I can talk. Um, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm sure people think, think I'm weird. I, you know, I've been comfortable with that for a long time because, I mean, even when I was younger, I had interests that weren't generally very common, and I've, and I've continued that through the years. Okay, Gail, what about you? Yes, I've been uh, labelled a weird um, black sheep of the family, a hippie, all of those things. I've always stood out slightly different with my um, beliefs and so but I, I don't mind that I run with that I, I can accept other people making comments like that because I look objectively at life I look at things very differently and I can witness it at work so I don't have a problem with other people thinking other things about it I'll, I'll quite happily talk about it Steve, in regards to um, your question about whether we we uh, share a lot or or we keep sort of things secret, it really just depends on the person. I, I you know I I think probably you know because of a lot of the things I've gone through, I don't t tend to be evangelical about things, and so I tend to wait until someone is open about something before I speak to them. If that makes sense, I d I don't. I don't push it or I don't feel like I need to always talk about it, but I enjoy talking about it. And so if the opportunity throws itself open and then, then I'm happy to. That makes sense. Um, I deal with people who do get evangelical about it. They want to share how wonderful it is to achieve what they've achieved and how great they feel. And they rush out and say, I'm going to tell everybody. And I say, please don't do that. So I think you're crazy. No, they won't. They know me. Then I'm not crazy. They'll be fine. And they come back and say, everyone thinks I'm crazy. And I say, well, you, the thing is you're dealing with stuff that is outside of the usual frame of reference of the ego in the physical world. You're dealing with stuff that people usually assign to belief. And um, I did a bit of a survey with clients and most of them came back and said, my friends do not believe that I'm happy and flowing because of doing any energy work with you. They want to know who the guy is, what drug I'm on, or why I'm delusional. And in fact, one person actually had an intervention. All her friends came around and wanted to know why she wasn't going, getting drunk and cheating on her husband again with them, why she was just happy. They believed that there was something wrong with her. It really does get that weird. Wow. Yeah, people people just don't don't tend to believe you can be happy through finding your own inner self and flow and and flowing with the chi. They really don't believe it. it's got to be a guy. You've got to be on a drug or you've got to be on. You know, it's really challenging for a lot of people. And of that group that tried the intervention, I think I ended up working with three or four people. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. and and teaching them how to do it because it's it's just not something that you're you're shown in daily life what you're shown in daily life is you've got to believe in a religion you've got to believe in in some sort of god or icon believe in some sort of drug or some sort of way of being there's a thousand different things and you just pick which you believe in and that's the way through and of course with this stuff this universal energy it doesn't care what you believe it's what unites us it it cuts through ego and it doesn't matter whether you believe in it it is the force with which your life is uh, is life is powered so by coming closer to it you have to go through that process of ego death and drop all those beliefs and aspirations and attachments and work with what is and the ego has a has a very tough time with that which is why we call this gateway 
ego death because um in going through ego death we all align with the one force and the way it needs to work whether we believe in it or not whether we like like it or not and as i say to people um in the rain both the believer and the non-believer get wet and and that's a very hard challenge to let go of all of those props all those beliefs and religions and aspirations that you've you've hung on to for a long time you have you come across that i have um yeah i i mean i agree with everything you're saying I, it, it's always interesting how people conceptualize what you've been through because it it, it changes depending on their filter and so um you know, I, I think a lot, a lot of times you just try to state the facts and you try to be as objective as possible and, and then you leave it. There's, just, there's never a need to push it or to prove it, never a need to convince. Steve, you mentioned in the last segment um, the ego death. Do you find in your work um, there is a lot of resistance from people during this phase? I know from my personal experience I found that extremely challenging. Yeah, I just absolutely. wondered if it's something... Yeah, the yeah. ego death is, is I refer to it as the gateway to enlightenment because the ego, or what we call generically the ego, um, it's not actually the ego. The term ego in corporate as used by psychology includes lots of processes, some objective and some subjective. So the ego itself doesn't die. There are certain subjective processes that, that uh, lose power. The, this, this ego, this collection of processes define who we are in our world, in our frame of reference, our social status, what we are, what's expected of us from family and friends, career, what we expect from life. It's this structure to which we build, which we think we are in the world in which we live. And once that's completely destroyed, the challenge for that to be completely destroyed and to see everything a different way is enormously difficult because we, we're convinced that the ego is actually protecting us well, it's actually not protecting us. It's the, it's the prison within which we live. But coming out of that prison means we have to face lots of emotional consequences that were attached to those structures. And facing those emotional consequences is not easy. For instance, uh, maybe so-and-so never loved me. Maybe my MX boss didn't like me. Maybe I really wasn't very good at that job. These are things that the ego tends to suppress and not deal with. And what is the challenge in going through the ego death process is we have to start dealing with that stuff. So yeah, it, it, is, it does fight and it fights hard. And um, that's, that's natural. That's absolutely natural because what, we did, what we're doing is we're destroying the old to bring in the new. And that's at the core of all spiritual transformation. Transformation involves a death and a rebirth in every sense. So the ego structures have to die. I use the analogy of... Um, the caterpillar's ego can never understand what it's like to be a butterfly because it only understands caterpillar. And so the caterpillar and its ego have to completely be demolished in order for the butterfly to emerge. If that makes sense, that the, the, there is no easy transition. You can't, you can't understand what it's like to be 20 when you're eight years old but it's because it's impossible. You have to go through eight years old, leave eight years old behind and then and grow. And, and, and what the ego is trying to do is always look ahead and it just can't. You have to, it has to be abandoned. And um, the emotional consequences of that, the emotional implications of things that are tied to it is tough. So yeah, absolutely. It's very hard. It's hard for me, hard for you, hard for everybody. You know, I think there's an additional um issue when it comes to discussing ego is that it seems to me the most common definition that people use for ego tends to be arrogance. You know, somebody has a big ego. And yeah. so a lot of times I think when you're trying to use language to try to explain in this direction, you run into that because people interpret the ego as arrogance and that's not what it is. It's, it's a concept of knowledge of self, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. You talk, you're talking about uh, common sort of street parlance means you're in ego, the arrogant, absolutely, versus the more clinical de uh, definition of as, as, as a, a cognitive self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah, it, and, e and even more than that, there's also this, the psychological definition of ego that's come down from like Freud and Jung, and even that's different. Yeah. Well, this is why in my work, I don't actually use that. We use a completely different system because the problem with ego is it's, it it has many meanings and it incorporates lots of different processes, uh, some of them objects and some of, some of them subjective. And so 
in, in the techniques I teach, we don't use that. We look at the processes in different ways. We look at the objective ones and the subjective ones differently. But you're right. You're absolutely right. And one of the problems in modern parlance is that uh, it means different things. One of the one of the biggest issues, for instance, is soul connections. That's an absolute chestnut. When I f first started doing my work many years ago, soul connections were called soul connections, and then some of them were called uh, karmic connections, and some are called soulmates, and and now now everything's a twin flame. The same exactly the same symptoms that were ascribed to be called a soul connection or soulmate and now ascribed to a twin flame and anything less is called a soul connection and and that doesn't actually mean a soul connection anymore. so so the problem with um social terms is they change and so when when i so in that case for instance i use the term soul connections which refers to it globally universally generically if that makes sense to try and cut through that and people coming new into something get very very confused by that terminology because it's changed particularly with social media now yeah Absolutely. you have to describe the context yeah because you shred the context i've had people tell me that they've had 10 soul connections what they mean is they've felt connected to 10 people that's not a soul connection that's just an empathic connection they felt connected to somebody and so they then demean the term soul connection and say so this one must be a twin soul and they don't understand that the soul connection term is a generic for when souls are connected across time with karma and lessons and so the favorite thing is to say steve gunn only understands about these he doesn't understand about those and they they keep making different terminologies to fit their expectations and that's where it gets very difficult for people coming new into it and they get very confused and I spend more and more of my time explaining the basics to people and it's why I brought out my new book Soul Connections the Myths and the Metaphysics because you have to take it back to the basic principles in order to cut through all of that. I think the danger with the um, social media is anyone can write an article or anyone can write a blog, give it a title and, you know, the minute it's got a few clicks, that, that becomes somebody's reality and then people sort of jump onto that and suddenly there's a new term for, you know, a situation and they give it a, a spiritual in abbreviated commons name and then people run with that idea. So I can see why that's sort of happened with the whole twin flame thing. It's just somebody's come up with that name and it's people have jumped on the bandwagon with it there's uh, you're I absolutely agree. right and there's there's a very great tendency to do things like to genderize energy for instance um people often criticize me and say steve gunn says there's no male and female energies well well there really aren't energy doesn't have gender energy doesn't have any physical form it to have gender and your your and my energy could have been male female and alternating and any and all in the past it it doesn't actually have gender and so what people then do is mix social issues like dominance control and assertiveness and make that as a male energy and make submission and compassion and nurturing a female energy and that's absolutely not how it is everybody needs that power and assertion and center of uh, the one energy and compassion and nurturing the other energy to be in balance whether they're male or female so my sort of work, you're then fighting that issue as well. And then people extrapolate that into relationships. And um, then we get gods and goddess energies and icons of, yeah, and it just all gets a bit crazy and fluffy. So, so um, common um, spirituality, popular spirituality is a mix of religion, mysticism, icons, metaphysics, spiritualism, spirituality and, and everything else. And that's why it's so confusing to people. Mm, definitely. Okay, I was just going to ask you, um, Steve, so obviously you've talked about the sort of popular spirituality and it's certainly very evident here in the Western world. Do you, do you witness that differently from some of the more traditional Eastern um, countries? Do they, in the work that you've done, is it generally from the Western world that you would get clients who have completely run off with the, the pop culture, spirituality? No, it's, it's more to do with the individual than the culture, to be honest with you. Right. It's more to do with um, – the thing about pop spirituality that's very common is most of it is designed to fit the ego. And mm -hmm. the ego is very hierarchical. The ego loves hierarchy 
It loves to differentiate things. It loves to genderize them, to polarize them, and to attach icons and symbolism. And that's that's something I find, particularly with the spiritualist movement as well. If you look at the spiritualist movement, it's very polarized. The spiritualists see lots of angels and demons, where the the rest of us see challenged energies and and flowing energies. They tend to be very polarized, very hierarchical. The people who can talk to spirits are very charmed individuals in spirit mm. in spiritualist world. They're not ordinary individuals who can do that. And as you know, we can teach anyone to do this in, in a short space of time. So I don't see that the universe is hierarchical. So pop spirituality is is very much hierarchical, higher selves, lower selves, all that sort of thing. Um, anger is negative energy and happiness is a positive energy as opposed to just being uh, two energies which people experience. And that feeds the ego because the ego is hierarchical. The ego likes Dallas. It doesn't like the boring stuff that everything is equal and we, you know, we can work with it and, and make it all flow. It likes its drama. It likes its, uh, its good guys and its bad guys. It likes its polarization. It likes its icons and its gods and its goddesses. It does. You know, there's another thing, too. It, the, a lot of the popular spiritual movements are all about accepting everything as well. And I think when... when you know, like what Gail was saying earlier, when you have like tons of articles and tons of blogs and all this stuff coming in, I think a lot of a lot of people sort of lean towards trying to reconcile it all rather than throwing out the bad stuff. Yeah, I think popular spirituality is pick what I call pick and mix spirituality. The idea is that spirituality is whatever you want it to be, and you can come in and you can you can oh I like that one, I don't like that one, I like this one, and I don't like that one, and that because we're all individual, we can pick and mix what spirituality is. And that if suddenly something becomes emotionally conflicting, we can drop that and then believe in something else. And so it is a it is a way of having a convenient model of the universe that suits us and doesn't challenge us too much emotionally. I think another interesting thing is it doesn't actually teach you how to achieve what we're talking about being the flow. It can tell you how you're supposed to feel and point in this direction end up actually making you feel worse because you don't know how to achieve that. And that, for me, is something that I found to be a massive flaw mm. in a lot of the things that I looked into and experienced. Yeah. It's, it's but the, it does, nothing mm. actually teaches you how to achieve. It's the learning about dentistry doesn't affix your teeth, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm, exactly. It's conceptual spirituality, whereas spiritual, spirituality and, and the spiritual finding the balance in that sense of spirituality of being of the spirit, of the soul, of the energy, of the flow, is hard work. They're, they're disciplines and their skills. They're not knowledge. There's there's no knowledge required. It's it's more like uh, learning to swim or ride a bike than it is to uh, learn math. Exactly. It ends up making people actually feel worse because you feel like, why can't you achieve this state that people talk about and you read about? And But actually, it's because you need to be taught how to do that. This, again, the ego likes to do it its way. It likes to say, I, I, I'd speak to people say, but I want to find peace my way. And I say, well, in the universe in which you live, peace is not define differently it is a balance of energies and yes, you, you don't exactly. have a choice on that it's like physical health you can't define physical health in your way it, it is a definite balance of phys physiological things and, and and the ego hates that because it wants to do it itself it wants to define it itself i, I, I have noticed um certainly recently and I obviously I wasn't objective at the time when I was very much caught up in my sort of spiritual addiction phase. But I can see now a lot of people um, avoid having to deal with sort of challenging situations and remain very much in positive thought. We'll get you there. And I avoid that person. I, I want to live in a bubble. I don't want to be um, subjected to images of war or animal abuse or or anything that confronts uh, you know their their little bubble of positivity and I I understand that because I was in it myself but it's really obvious now sort of standing back and being in a place of balance that you really gain nothing from avoiding being around the challenging situations and that it's really unhealthy and unnatural and against the flow of the energy of the universe to to try and avoid such challenging people and situations. That is where you grow your most. 
So that's really obvious to me when I look at um, social media now, people desperately hanging on to the, the good times only. That's a, that's a very valid point. Sorry, Mike, you go. I was just concurring. That is, that's been my experience as well, too. And, and I think it takes, I don't know, it might take some time to get to the point where you actually leap into the more challenging situations, you know, rather than avoiding them. You, I think you, after a while you begin to relish them. You do. It's quite empowering. <laughs> The other thing that's interesting is when we're challenged, when we're not in a healthy state and we've approached people, they've pushed us away because they don't like our energy. Um, and then, you know, um, you can't really turn it around and push other people away because that's an opportunity to help them. So a lot of, I, I do go on Facebook and annoy people and say, why not reach out to that person and explain that you might be able to help or, you know, point them in the right direction, have some healthy boundaries rather than just push them away or do the popular um, social media spirituality of painting a smile on everything and pumping sunshine because it doesn't work. Because if there's a need for positive thinking, ask yourself why there's a need for positive thinking. There's, there's a need for positive thinking because something is not balanced inside. Mm, Otherwise, definitely. you wouldn't have a need for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it really is quite a dangerous trap to fall into because, uh, you know, for some people who take it to the extreme, it, you you literally spend your day uh, fearing your thoughts. That I certainly did. That if I don't think positively, I, I'm attracting all these awful things are going to happen to me. So it, it's a really, it's a frantic place to live in when you're sort of constantly living all these positive quotes and, and trying to run from challenging people and challenging situations i i really feel for people now when i can look back on it and know that i've been in that situation and, and how dangerous a place it is the dreaded law of attraction the secret has done wonders for that hasn't it i can't tell you the number of people are absolutely distraught at having challenges in lives that actually believe they created it and they attracted it and mm. uh are, are yeah. so suicidal and fed up and are trying to manifest this and manifest that and as i say pumping sunshine and painting smileys on everything and just struggling and um when it first came out people generally accepted it because it's it appeals to the ego to have control that you know the universe as i describe it universe is your bitch just learn how to control it you know um very appealing to the ego it's not true you know but um and the other thing is that god loves you so much he give you everything you want that's the other the premise of it. Well, my argument is what sort of parent would give you everything you want and what sort of child would you be if you got it? You know, so there's some very, very fundamental errors in, in the law of attraction. And people people do struggle and they go, go around perpetually trying to be happy, thinking they can manifest all this stuff. When challenge and turmoil and uh, transcending uh transcending problems is very much part of the spiritual way it's the same with abundance spirituality is not about abundance it's about acceptance if you look at these spiritual icons they they didn't have abundance they had acceptance empowerment all the great things so popular spirituality has gone down its own route it is it's, it is its own thing now and it's very much enslaves people as you've said in this show and the previous show gail and it's something that is becoming harder to um tell people because the first thing they hit when they start searching is they hit that stuff the same way as if they start searching for weight loss the first thing you're going to get is diet pills and at level 300 they're going to find diet and exercise the real thing but they've got 300 there to entrap them before they get to something that actually works so that the very popularity of it is what makes it dangerous mm. yes it reached a huge target audience and then rippled out way beyond that. So people who perhaps would never have picked up, uh, um, you know, what, a self-help book or, or any kind of spiritual book suddenly grabbed onto this idea. But it, for me, it, it steps completely in the opposite direction of what oneness and, and real spirituality is about. And it's not about wanting. If you're always sat in a place of wanting, it means you don't have enough. You don't feel in a place of balance that you feel you need to have this car, this house, this job, you know, this amount of money in the bank. It's, uh, you know, it's the complete polar opposite of actually what spirituality is about. And I think once you've transcended through that, experienced your own healing, then you realize that actually 
you don't really need any of those things. Those things don't bring you peace. Those things don't bring you balance. And uh, that was one of the, the biggest lessons for me. What would you say to somebody to encapsulate that? If you could say it in a couple of lines, what would you say to somebody who was going to listen to you? Um, <laughs> find your peace, find your balance. It's not in things, it's inside of you and you will be far more peaceful when you're not searching. Would you, not would you agree that we are the person that can't do that because we're the person that got us to lose it? In the first place, yes. Yeah. You can't see it when you're in it. You can't be objective. Because hmm. one of the it problems is when the ego is in control, we can't get out of it because the very definition of ego is that it blinds us to what we're doing. Mm, absolutely. Which yeah, is why you can't me. read your way out of it. You need training. You need to be taught how to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And very strict discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, what would you say to people? What would you say to somebody who was in trouble? If you could give them two lines and they would actually listen to you, what would you say? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. I probably have to think about that for a while. Um, no, come on. You're not wheedling out of this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it actually maybe reflect back to what I said last show in that, you know, if, if people are in a state where they're extremely unhappy and they're suffering, then, then I would say that maybe some different choices have to be made. Yeah. Just simply, simply that, 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 that what you've done up to that, up to this point obviously hasn't brought you out of that. And, and, you know, I was going to make another point that, that I think culturally we're, we're sort of inclined to think of, of spiritual teachers and gurus as sort of like the, like a cross between Buddha and Spock or something like that, where, <laughs> where, they're, where they're always happy and, 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 you know, full, full of, there's, there's no sadness. They never suffer. They never go through quote negative emotions. It's always just, you know, like they're sort of above the fray. And I don't think that's real. I think even with training, the difference is that you process emotions quicker. You, you feel them at their strength, you go through them, and then they just don't hang on and, and you're not stuck to them. Absolutely right. What you do is you learn to deal with anger, frustration. You, you learn to channel it and flow with it, not to block it. The, the idea of the spirituality and spiritual balance being going around like a grinning fool all day is just not real. Exactly. It's going and, through and the that's... experience and, and back to balance, yeah. Right. And I, but I think, especially in terms of alter, alternate spirituality, people tend to think of it that way, that, 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 um, you, that you can't really ha have all, all these problems or suffering. And I think that actually makes it worse when you're already suffering and, and you're thinking that you're not supposed to be suffering, you must be doing it wrong, and then you just get into this really awful cycle with it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Sarah? Um, what would I say? Firstly, I would say that they don't need to, to feel that way, that there is help, but you can't see it yourself and that it's very, very important to seek somebody out that can help you achieve the balance and flow that is available. I'd also say it's very difficult, but it's worth it. Um, it's hard to reach out, isn't it? It's hard to admit defeat and to reach out. There's something the ego doesn't yeah. like, yeah? And it's okay because so many people feel that way. So it's okay to admit that. I think that's part of the... Um, I think when you realize and then you're willing to admit there's a problem, is at the stage when you're ready to change it. Yeah. Until then, you carry on pretending or then you'll have moments when it's, oh, actually, it's all fine. And then it's not again, but then the moments come back again. And you go back, what well, I did, back and forth, back and forth. But at, at some point, it's enough, actually. This isn't right. So it's time to surrender, I guess, and say, I want to do whatever it is I need to do. And the only way to do that is to find somebody that can help you. I find you, you help me. And the work that you have taught me and continue to do has been the only thing that's ever helped me. And I've tried lots of different things. So it is vitally important to find that right person, whoever that is, but I highly recommend Steve. And then take that next journey of uh, going through 
learning to deal with it and remembering that actually there's always challenges in life that we're never going to not have challenges but it's how, like Mike said it's how we deal with those and being able to deal with them in a lot uh, quicker way a lot more manageable and regain flow but it's about and having it's the techniques it. isn't it isn't it about yeah, having the because techniques we can't do that yeah. ourselves yeah. we can't and even now we still still need to be reminded and so all i've taught to... you is techniques that that you can use to empower yourself yeah yes yes mm. definitely I, I would say as well i'd like to add to that if possible that it it's so empowering having gone through that journey to then encounter more challenges in life from a more balanced place, work through them, come through them the other side, come back to balance. It's such an empowering feeling because you know, you know what, whatever life puts in front of you, you know you have the skills within yourself to work through that and that you don't need to constantly seek something outside of yourself to get you through those times that you actually have all of that power within you to work through those challenges and it it, it just brings such a sense of peace that you know that you can work through it so I think that's what people may you know you would struggle with that if you're stuck in a really desperate situation at the time but, but it really is so empowering to be able to work through the challenges in life come out the other side find your balance and know that you're able to do that with any situation mm. Excellent point. The ego tends to think of healing as getting to the point where life is only joy. That doesn't exist. Mm. It's always challenge. Exactly. It's how you deal with challenge. It's how you thrive on challenge, isn't it, as opposed to avoid it? Yeah. Yes. Because I was And saying, you don't take it personally. That's the that's the interesting take... point, the depersonalization, yeah. Yeah. I, I, my perspective with people has changed so much. It, so I still encounter really challenging situations at times. And uh, I, I kind of smile now at the universe and go, well, thanks so much. And I don't take it personally. And this is from someone who's taken everything so personally, has always been really sensitive and upset by people's comments. And now it's like, okay, it's okay. It's not personal. In, in my viewpoint of, and working with other people and different situations, utterly turned about because of it. The the st the ego state personalizes everything. Even if it's raining, it's personal when you're in the ego state. Oh, why is it raining when I want to do this on this particular day? Absolutely. So once we come out of that into the more objective state and depersonalize, then we can deal with it more easily. A lot of people get very freaked out by the depersonalization. They say to me, but I don't want to be cold and insensitive. And I explain that's not what it is. It's just that it doesn't seem super personal. You, you're still emotional. In fact, you're very much more emotional, but you can deal with everything. We still deal with anger and frustration and sadness, probably at an even higher level. But because we flow mm. with it, it's not personal. It isn't a stick that beats us or a monkey that sits on our back anymore. Yeah. Hmm. I actually find objectivity far more compassionate and balanced than uh, than when you are sort of very personalized with people. And, and people who are in that ego mode really see it as you behaving in a cold way. But actually, it's pure compassion most of the time. Well, you are preaching to the converted here. I am, in certain circles, seen to be seen as cold and horrible because I'm objective. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can't avoid that. If you're objective, you're looking for the solution. You're, 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 you're not immersing yourself in the problem. You're helping find the solution. Something I find is people write me two, two pages of email about their story, and I say, look, thanks, but I don't read anybody's story. And they say, but surely you've read hundreds of thousands. I have never read anybody's. What I'm here to do is help you from here forward, not to go back over what happened. I respect that that happened, but it's yours. It's your experience to date. That's not how I can help you. I can help you by transcending that. And some people get super offended by that, that I don't want to hear the story. And they get very insulted because they're so attached to it. And by not listening to their story, I'm sort of offending them in some dreadful way. People take it so personally. That's why it proves the point that the girl was just saying, <laughs> and you said. They do, and they do see objectivity as cold when it's not. Yeah, I explain to people that ego is not who you are. It's the programming. The analogy I use is a little crude, and it's not meant to offend anybody, but it's, it's saying that if the anorexic looks in the mirror, they're always going to see the fat person because the ego is programmed with that. And whatever's happening physically... 
they can't see past that because in that situation, the ego has got this this filter, as I think Gail described it earlier. And we've all got a set of filters that life has given us which make this ego. So the ego isn't us. It is a bunch of filters and blind spots. And so it's not unusual to be trapped within one's own filters and blind spots. And it's no admission of any any lack lacking in anybody or... Um, any horrendous wrongdoing or inadequacy to admit that we have these filters and blind spots and to actually ask for help to get out of it. But anybody who's worked with particularly addicts knows that takes a long time to admit you've, you've got a problem and to ask for help and to actually be shown around those blind spots, yeah? Yeah. Sarah, what would you do again and what would you not do again? Oh, um... I'm not sure what would I do again. I wouldn't. What I wish I'd done is work, learn to work with my energy sooner. Okay. I wish that I'd done that sooner, but I guess I had to take as much as I did to get to the level that I did that made me actually finally do something about it. I don't know what I would or wouldn't do again because I guess. That's how it is. That's what it all got, got you here. to where you are now. Yeah, yeah, so it is what it is. I don't think I would change or I'm able to change any of those things because at each stage I, I, when I was searching for something, it, the more it proved to me there was a problem with it, it wasn't helping, the more it um, made me seek for something that did. And I think I had to get to that stage in order to be ready to do it. So actually, I wouldn't change any of it, but I do wish I was able to learn those techniques a lot earlier. And I wish people were taught how to deal with their emotions and their energy. It should be natural. That should how that should be how it is, because energy is so important, the most important thing. It affects everything. And if that was taught to children, it would never get, well, in most cases, it would never become the big problems that it does in later life for most people. Not being able to deal with their emotions, not being able to deal with energy. We don't, it's almost like we have these things with no instructions. So if that became natural, it would transform everything and make life a lot more enjoyable for everyone. Thank you. Gail, I hope what that makes sense. <laughs> it does immensely, immensely. Gail, what would you do or not do again? Uh, do you know what, Steve? I don't know that I would change anything. There have been times where I've thought, oh, I wish I didn't do this and I wish I didn't do that. But the reality is I've worked a lot on accepting that all of those things happened, that I had to journey through all of that. I still have to deal with the consequences of some of the things that I did during that journey. Um, but even even having to work through that has brought me a greater sense of peace because, boy, did I learn some valuable lessons along the way. So, no, I wouldn't change anything. I, I certainly grew and experienced some amazing things from that, from that, even from the really challenging times. I guess the only sad part for me is that it took me to my early 40s to experience ego death and to stop worrying about who I was and making uh, money and, and having material life and uh, didn't focus on helping other people a little bit earlier. But this is the way that life is. Excellent. Thank you. Mike, what about you? Well, in terms of, the, in terms of what um, I think I wish I would have done differently, which is something maybe we all probably wished, is that when going through the crisis part of it, I kind of wish that, you know, I would have realized that it was actually a crisis and, and started to look earlier for answers. I think I, I stayed with it a really long time. And I, I guess we all have to sort of circle our own mazes before we come out. Um, in terms of what I think I probably would still do again is I've always sort of, um, you know, tried to be as objective as possible. And I've always felt that, um, a lot of, a, a lot of objectivity is what we really don't want to hear. And so I always felt like, I tried my best to face that and to listen to what I di didn't want to hear, you know, all along. 
And so I would do that again. Thank you. I would not change anything because I agree with uh, most of you that it's what got us to where we are now. I think there are times we would have changed everything, but ultimately it's what, it's what gets you to where you are. Mm. 